Alex, thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you, buddy. And I really appreciate you doing it, especially because uh, you're a little jet lagged. You just came back from a very lovely trip. But uh, I know it's not easy to have a conversation with you in that state. So again, I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, you're welcome, buddy. I'm happy to be here. And it was definitely a jet lag, well worth it. You know, being in Argentina when they won the World Cup was absolutely incredible. We were in Buenos Aires as the game started, flying to uh, Calafate, which is where one of the only growing glaciers in the world is. Um, on the During the first half of the, the game, we were on the flight. The pilot was announcing the score, got off the flight, landed in El Chalten, the uh, airport in Calafate, um, and watched the rest of the game in Calafate. It was an incredible, incredible game, and being in Argentina was truly special. Wait, you were on a flight that in which the pilot was commentating on the game while you were on the flight, and you you landed, and you still had enough time to watch the rest of the game. Yeah, yeah, I How got on my phone <clears throat> while we la- like as we landed. I got on my phone, um, streamed the game watched the score, ran to the, the closest bar in the airport, and then we all parked ourselves with some cafe con leche, some empanadas, and watched the second half of the game in an Argentinian airport in the south of Argentina going to see the glaciers. So that flight was like super short, basically. It was like it was like a yeah, it was like a two hour flight. Wait, but the game is like what, ninety minutes? The game's ninety minutes. So the game started a little bit into the flight. Got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Now yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. I was like, that. that was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, a little into it. The, yeah, I actually didn't really, didn't make that connection. You were there while they actually won the World Cup. That's incredible. It was incredible. Yeah. You, you went there because you have family there, right? My husband. Yeah, my husband's parents. So his, his father is from Buenos Aires. His mom's from Corrientes in the north of Argentina. Um, dad moved here for a Fulbright. Um, Several decades ago, husband grew up in San Diego, where his father is a professor at UCSD. Um, and then I actually lived in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, 12 years ago, um, three miles from where my husband's uh, father grew up. But I hadn't met my husband at the time. He was actually for, you know, I was there for 10 months. He was actually there, I think, at least a couple weeks overlap with me. But we didn't know each other at that point. So we were we were both there, but hadn't met each other yet. That's that's incredible. Uh, well, yeah, I'm I'm actually planning to go there. I've never been, and I'm planning to go there at the end of our world tour that we're planning on right now. It's Spectacular. Argentina is probably going to be the last location, actually. Now that I, think I love it. it. I got some recommendations oh, for you, buddy. I can't wait. Yeah. So yeah, I will. I will definitely uh, take your recommendation uh, when the time comes for it. I can't yeah, wait. I got plenty. Um, so the reason that I want to talk to you is because we met uh, at an event uh, that that was revolving around uh, the development in the psychedelic research space and industry and all that stuff. And um, you are in that space to different capacities. You are, uh, uh, I guess, are you considered a professor in UCLA or? So I'm an assistant clinical professor at UCLA and attending psychologist in the medical school and previously was the director of training for a center where we had a grant through the state of California um, through the Mental Health Service Act, which is actually this like act um, at the state level where 1% of anyone's income over a million dollars goes into a bucket of money to fund mental health in the state. Historically, the preponderance of that money was used for intervention. Um, and then in the more recent years, we've started to be able to use it for prevention and early intervention. So I was director of training for a center where we were working with juvenile justice, child welfare, the education system, various systems of care within LA County specifically to essentially help them adjust to be more trauma informed, which is in so much as essentially trying to help them understand impacts of historical inequities, um, adverse childhood experiences, burnout, all of these factors that can like create a context for just population level kind of, I don't know, not well-being all, all, all the way through severe cases of like actual PTSD from like war and things like that or so there I mean essentially the the role of this particular center was focused not necessarily on treating people who needed intervention but creating structures at a population level now I understand what you mean to to reduce kind of the likelihood that people will need intervention so an awareness that will help 
uh, cushioned the situation. Basically, you, you, yeah. pr- you, again, like you said, prevented it. So essentially, That's just it. yeah. So you're educating basically people who are entering into their PhD positions to how to maneuver through the space, right? Like, well, this is actually, I mean, we were working with teachers, with janitors, with librarians. Oh, wow. With, I mean, you name it. Okay, with so I did not understand the scope for Child welfare this. workers, like anyone in LA County that was coming into contact with any resident of LA County. And to what, how was it like technically executed? So like you had centers and they would like come for like a lecture in, let's say in UCLA or like that was a program in which you had, we would go to them. I Mm -hmm. mean, we had trainings in these various places we had in addition, because training alone is not sufficient. I mean, you need training to understand how to diagnose the problem, ways that you can put on your own oxygen mask so that you don't create further problems that then perpetuate the problem. Um, but ultimately like training alone is not sufficient. You need consultation on an ongoing basis. You need programmatic changes. You need like leadership level changes to reorganize the systems. Otherwise you just inure people to the very systems that cause the problems initially. And so really the, the broad intention of the center of this like whole public partnership for well being, which is the broader kind of like um, umbrella term for it. I exactly. Guess. The umbrella over this particular center is really trying to do that, trying to help kind of the county and the state to essentially do better by folks, to to have better structures in place um, and do better not only by the, the people they're serving, but, you know, in order to serve people well, you have to treat the people well who are being of service. And if you have systems that are totally problematic, like, for example, a child welfare system that's problematic, then, you know, very often what you're going to see is that the, the child welfare workers are not well taken care of. The janitorial staff are not well taken care of. The people who are security at the front desk are not well taken care of. So you really have to think about, like, what ultimately do we need to do in order to do right by the population? And very often charity, not even very often, always charity starts at home. And so it's how do we help our own internal workforce to put on their own oxygen masks so that they have the tools to like promote their own well-being? And how do we readjust the very structures in which these folks exist in such a way that they can ultimately sustain their well-being practices without needing to continue to fight and bump up against a system that doesn't actually promote their well-being. So it takes both like the internal resource promotion for the individual and the systemic kind of adjustments at the programmatic level. And those two together in concert can hopefully kind of sustain systems that can better kind of impact population level well-being. It's so encouraging to know that this kind of work is already being done. I, I was not aware. So you're literally taking the, like, if, if you don't have the people in the system, if they don't feel like they're being taken care of, then the pain that they experience to different degrees perpetuates throughout, it, like, it echoes into the system, basically. And then, especially when you're dealing with, like you said, child welfare and, like, systems in which people already, there's plight all around. Now you're amplifying that by the fact that the people who are taking care of them are disgruntled or upset or, uh, again, don't feel secure and safe themselves. So then the way they talk to them, the way they you being received at the what, you know entrance to like a center or whatever, like all of that plays a major role in how you feel while you're being put through the machine. Exactly, the, yeah. you, you nailed it. Yeah, I mean that, it, that's just it, and that's I mean it's a struggle we 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 face. In the systems of care we have, you know, in child welfare and libraries, which are actually the front line of the homelessness crisis very often, Um, but also in how we train our future physicians, how we train our future nurses, how we train our future psychologists and master's level therapists. I mean, we have a lot of problems in the structures we've created, and we also have done good things, too. Um, so there's some, obviously... You mean the, the way the system was? So yeah. Far? Yeah, I think there are structures that have been beneficial. And there's also a lot of structures in how we train the future folks who will go on to be our care providers that are highly problematic. Yeah, and, and that's what you're there basically uh, remedy. That, that's what you're trying to actually address. Yeah, and it's hard. 
Yeah, I bet. I, I recently had a conversation with Charles Eisenstein, and one of the things that came up in the conversation is that he said, uh, he pointed out something that I guess on the surface is very obvious, but I personally never thought about it in such dry terms, and it just, just checks out in such a phenomenal way. So he said that, you know, it's standard in economics, unless it's uh, measured by a dollar, it doesn't exist. So for example, unless, so for example, examples they gave is, you know, cooking a meal for your loved one or uh, singing a birthday song for your child. Unless you hire a band to sing a song that you exchange currency with, it doesn't exist in the economical model. But the economical model is supposed to measure what is valuable. And if we look at the specifics of what is valuable for humans, to think that it's just to hire a band to do that is to completely misunderstand what the human dimension is. You see what I mean? I say with Evan, everything you're saying like aligns so perfectly with that because like now you're putting an emphasis on the fact that no, 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 no. This adds tremendous value, if not like 90% of the value. If I'm coming to a center in which I know I'm going to be put through this, like, I'm, you know, I've been torn from my parents as a kid or whatever, and then I come into the, to the check, check up, whatever, like if you come to the front desk, and the, the woman is kind of like, you know, gives you the cold shoulder and like on her phone and just doesn't care. Here, fill this out. That changes everything about what I, first of all, think of the world. Right. And what I'm, up. it communicates to me what I'm about to experience. And then that's the kind of person I become. So I guess that it opened my mind always goes to the child example because there it's so pronounced. It's okay. so pronounced. Yeah, the research supports that. I mean, really what we've seen is that all it takes is one safe, stable, nurturing adult. And it doesn't have to be a parent. It doesn't have to be someone you have extensive contact with. It can be a janitor. It can be a teacher. It can be a librarian. But having someone in a child's life where they can see that the other can be a person of compassion, of care, and of like, you know, someone who is of grace and, and able to do good things in the world can be enough to change the trajectory of a child because you essentially model for that child that there can be a path, even if that path is not shown to you by your biological parents or your foster parents or whoever rears you, you can still have a modeling that demonstrates to you a path that you can ultimately take that can lead you down a road where you can be a person of compassion. So you're saying that research shows that all you need is one person to show you that care? Just one. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and that it's so easy, huh? Yeah. And yet the, the amount of trauma, problem, that's easy. Yeah, because the amount of trauma in society is so enormous that we don't even realize that most of us, literally most of us, are traumatized in that way or another. Yeah. As if they're just like some kind of a, let's not call it trauma because it sounds like such a big word, but that's some good. Oh, a little T trauma. I think we can, den I think we can denote a difference between mm -hmm. trauma, like little T, which is just like having, you know, being alive, just like it, it, this, the stress of being alive and existing in a world that has structural problems and that we have our own internal kind of struggles, our own familial struggles, our own community-based struggles. I think it's safe to say that everyone has had some level of trauma in their lives. And then we could think about capital T trauma, which is when that kind of struggle, someone can't shake it off. Mm -hmm. So that struggle sticks around. And so someone yeah. is kept with that struggle unable to still like unable to shake it off and it has long lingering impacts on their functioning and on their ability to be in the world and that big t trauma not everyone has but i think it's safe to say all of us just by nature of being in existence have a certain level of traumatic stress of trauma yeah the little t trauma i guess i would call that it sounds like there's little deficits in in the emotional diet when the, when you're growing up so like you you were lacking a little bit of attention or lacking a little bit of uh feeling like you've accomplished something or like that kind of stuff and that, that really carries itself into adult life and we don't even realize it because it was never mitigated in any shape or form and it just stays there like a pattern basically yeah exactly so where does uh because you so your background is in psychology mm -hmm. right that's right Would, did you ever practice or you always went uh, you went directly to academia and yeah, no, I practiced. I um, practiced during graduate school under the supervision of some incredible psychologists, uh, one of which continues, two of which actually continue to be, you know, some very important mentors in my life, um, without whom I don't know where I would be. Um, but I, I was predominantly seeing kids from 
three to four years old, all the way actually to adults and the end stages of their lives. And so there was always this push in clinical psychology to move towards a specific focus area to, you know, focus your attention on a particular, you know, group of folks like, you know, I'm going to work with teens or I'm going to work with kids. And for me, I always gravitated towards lifespan because I feel like one of the greatest and perhaps selfishly, one of the greatest benefits of getting to be a psychologist is getting to be with people. Uh, often at their most difficult moments and getting to be with them at the various stages of their lives. Stages that you, you know, many of which have not gone through. For example, I've never been 70. I've never been 60. I've never been 80. Um, and so I think one of the beauties for me of being a psychologist, and I've also never been straight. I've never been black or brown. You know, it's, so it's you, you get to like essentially like be with someone and live as much as you can through their eyes and connect with them across these weeks in a way for me that I was always reticent to hyper-focus on a particular age group or socio-demographic or after racial or, you know, gender kind of identity because for me there's just, like, I think that the greatest kind of benefit for me of being a psychologist is the, the kind of being a fellow traveler in bodies that you don't live in and getting to be with people in ways that you don't live through the world in. That, that's what it's all about, I feel, like in general. Like I feel like that uh, insight that you man, uh, really like from the largest picture in which you imagine that this human machinery and something like, you know, the, the idea that the, all of us are really God kind of trying to experience from different perspectives. You know, um, whatever it is, it seems to be, like we, seems, we seem to also be a general organism outside of being individuals. So that definitely checks out from that perspective. But even in the smallest scale, like it, it, it's so fascinating to me to try and uh, understand what it must be like to be someone else that is completely different. Like I would never, like again, I unless I live that life, I will never understand what it's like to be, you know, somebody in Rwanda and just like that, just the, I don't know if it's the poverty level or if it's the just the lifestyle in general, um, a different sex. All that stuff, right? Uh, but here you actually get to experience it through a very attentive and close uh, distance because you have to address specific problems and issues in the way that, that their life on, are unfolding. So yeah, you get to like, you get this first person view of like exactly what it's like, must be like to be that person. Yeah, I mean, because for me, this is one of the very kind of flaws of our very evolutionary biology, right? I mean, we are kind of constructed in a way that is, I mean, we're built for survival. We're not built to, you know, feel good or do you have a link so? Let's, no, no, I was the answer. No, I really don't. Not really, as, okay, so your professional opinion as a psychologist is that we are built the way that we are right now. We're not built to like enjoy and thrive, we're built to survive. Yeah, I think our very evolutionary biology kind of propels us towards, um, a negative affect. I think it propels us towards shame and self-criticism. And I don't think it's ours to hold. I think it's a function of a species that, that knew that it's very, not new, you know, cognitively, but new intuitively, that it's very survival was intrinsically entwined with its ability to collectively, because we weren't the strongest. We weren't the best at seeing at night. We weren't the biggest. Our very survival was entwined with being in the tribe and giving enough to the tribe such that the tribe was powerful. And I think that because of our very evolutionary makeup, we didn't evolve to be happy. I really don't think so. I think we evolved to pass along the genes and again, to do so did not require us to be happy. Well, the Buddha agreed with you that, you know, uh, the fact that we got uh, from Attachment is suffering, right? So like, as long as you think that all there is into the physical matter, but you don't feel like there is some epigenetic phenomena that rises above that? Like, not even, I'm not even talking about culture. I'm talking about on the personal level. You know, yeah. that there's like patterns that express themselves above the genetic layer that, the, the genetic layer that, um, that allows us to be more than that? Absolutely. 
So, but, but what are you saying that that's kind of like what we're discovering now how to do is that? I, I think that, I mean, I would go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think the presupposition on all of that is that you have enough of your basic needs met in order to be able to then thrive. I didn't think of that. They, uh, throughout most of history, we didn't have the basic needs met. Like actually you had to spend most of your day hunting or gathering uh, rations or if it's uh, after the agricultural revolution, again, you have to, you know, or in the work. field all day. Yeah, and then you have to make sure that the surplus is kept. Like there's always some kind of a thing that you have to spend most of your time in that has to do directly with survival. I didn't think of that. And only now maybe in the last century or two where we kind of get to a place where it's okay we can auto automate some things and we can now start thinking about hey do i just want to be an artist mm -hmm. hey it's like before then it was he was a rarity that somebody had the privilege of doing something like that especially in our western culture i mean i do think there are examples probably of tribes and indigenous cultures that we don't know a ton about that had kind of a relatively kind of, you know, I don't know, stable, healthy relationship with its natural environment mm. um, and was able to, I mean, because like hunter gatherers really, if you're, if you're able to live with the land and your land is producing enough food, you can chill for quite a bit of time. The problem comes though, when you have another tribe that is, you know, concerned about its very survival and you know attacks the land that you're on and one of the biggest problems in our programming in addition to us you know just having difficulties with being happy is that we are it's a lot easier for us to give compassion to folks that are that are like us that look like us that that you know behave like us that that move like us and so we've seen this throughout history right i mean it's the reason neanderthals and other you know, non Homo sapien kind of early hominids or humans didn't don't no longer exist. Right? I mean, this is like the the very kind of genocides that, you know, created the context where the Homo sapiens are now the the ones that we, we had are the ones that we are. But ironically, that is actually the most natural thing. Like it mm -hmm. seems like we're the only ones that are slowly stepping out of potentially stepping out of this frame. Because you know, like this whole, like this phrase, it's natural. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. there's really nothing more natural than genocide. Like, it's just like, yeah, just hey, that's what animals do. Like a hundred, pretty much a hundred percent of all animal life ends up in somebody's teeth. Like, just mm -hmm. like, you know, so uh, I feel like, so I'm in the, uh, first of all, I, I take everything you're saying because I actually haven't thought of that, that, that up until about a hundred years ago, really, there was not a lot of, uh, basic layer of like getting everything that I need to survive. Like a vast majority of folks. Yeah. So we're, so we're now, now I feel like the, the, yeah. Yeah. And, but I just will, will, will preface what there were some, you know, in the culture that we've created, of course, if you're living in Downton Abbey, you know, meaning like that, that family or you're kind of of notable privilege. I mean, that's, that's why we've often seen the great philosophers and, you know, other kind of thinkers in history being people with either some amount or large amount of means mm. is because you are freed up from having to worry about your next meal and having to worry about your shelter. And that gives you a lot more capacity to be thinking about and big thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's a, that's exactly right. And, uh, you, you always have this, it's rare that you have somebody who was really have known it happens, but people that come from like nothing and become giants in history, it happens, but it's much, much rarer than people who actually come from either royalty or some kind of a giant privilege that they get to, like you said, they're free to actually think about a philosophy and mm -hmm. you know, not, not the next big, uh, the next big thing that's going to go wrong in their lives, basically. Right. Yeah. So what, so how do you, how did you get from doing that to diving into the psychedelic world? Mm. Cause I, obviously there's a lot of research going on now. There's a big renaissance of uh, understanding of what psychedelics can do for us as far as mental health, um, from psilocybin to THC to uh, even research with MDMA. But how did you find yourself all of a sudden diving into that space? 
I feel like ultimately the space I've always been interested in, even before I could like name it, has been consciousness. And I think psychedelics are just one window, a very powerful, important window into looking at consciousness. Um, I think that, you know, I did a lot of, you know, 20 years plus now of yoga, um, inclusive of meditation. Um, my research has been in mindfulness and meditation based interventions as well as compassion based interventions. Um, and you know, I, I think that for me, the question has always been what the hell, like, you know, like, what are we doing here? Like, why am I here? Why are any of us here? What impact do we have on here? Is here actually a thing or a manifestation of the mind? Or, I mean, I think it's the same reason that before any of this, I mean, I guess psychedelics happened before this, you know, but in my teens, the exploration of the psychedelics, but then in my early 20s, the minor in philosophy at University of Virginia, and like, you know, just the, you know, classes I took on, you know, the essentially like arguing in papers whether the chair exists or not. And and for me, like, I think that there's no question that I would prefer to spend my limited time with than, you know, how deep does this well run? Like, what is our consciousness? Like, is it, and I think for me, like also, is it, is it an antenna? Is it something that like ultimately is like connecting us to a universal source outside of ourselves? Is it a computer that functions in its own right that, you know, can just kind of cohere and integrate and make sense of information, but then doesn't have any kind of tethers electrically or otherwise to things outside of itself. Um, do the psychedelic experiences that I and others have, do those actually map on to, you know, or tap into rather deeper truths into what is, or are they purely mining the unconscious of, of, of me, the collective unconscious of, of the broader us? the the social kind of mores that put me here like or or and or is it telling us truths that are deeper about the universe that if we really look at it are giving us data about what maybe kind of underpins all this stuff and i think for me just that question has always been in my ear um since i was a kid and I think it's the reason I went into psychology. I think it's the reason I was fascinated and did research and meditation and mindfulness and compassion. Um, I think it's the reason I'm now interested in psychedelics. It's, I think it's just for me, the, the eternal question of why the hell are we here? So and, that's interesting. You went into it more from an ontological perspective mm. rather than, because as a psychologist, you would think, you know, most people in that space are interested in like, how is it like, what is it doing for us and stuff like that but you went to like for the big questions so like the philosophical mm. questions got you that's the thing that really hooked you yeah because i think it came my relationship with psychedelics came before my relationship I with see. any kind of psychology training but i wonder why the choice then wasn't mm. maybe physics you mm. see what I mean? Yeah. Like if if the big questions were the thing, you were still drawn to the human dimension. Yeah. There was something about that. Did, did you ever think about that or? That's a really good question. I mean, I, I think part of it was also maybe family history. You know, my mom's side of the family um, had a lot of substance use issues. My mom, as well as her sisters, were able to escape a lot of like the toxic kind of intergenerational traumatization. Um, my dad's side of the family came here as refugees. They were Holocaust survivors. My grandfather in Auschwitz, my grandmother in a work camp. Um, I think I got really interested really early with how bad things can go mm. with humans mm. um, and how just like crappy things can really take a turn for um, under the, you know, sometimes the voices among us that are the 
the loudest that are, can implant themselves into a collective consciousness of an entire population and, you know, create subhumans from that, create, you know, shared narratives that don't just get people to buy things or, you know... How we, how we dehumanize ourselves. Right. Dehumanize the other, right? I mean, how we so easily can yeah. can do that. And so I think my own kind of recent family history, especially on my father's side with Holocaust trauma, just I think really led me into this like domain of like, you know, why is human consciousness so... Um, easily taken over by toxic ideologies that can ultimately create context for mass extinction of the other. Mm. And I think for me, that was like the kind of like piece of, of the question of consciousness that really took over my kind of early kind of inquiry around it. I see. So, and this is something that when you brought it into uh, research, so basically the general um, operation you have around this stuff professionally is that you, first of all, you, you're an educator of, this is the thing that I guess I confused before, you're an educator of people who are stepping into their PhD positions mm -hmm. that might be working with substances and you're educating them on how to work with it legally, how to work with the government, like uh, within the ramifications of what's legal, all that stuff, right? But oh, I'll, so say that, say that again. So what I understood from you, and this yeah. you can correct me, I understood that uh, you uh, one of the things that you do in that space is that you educate people who stepping into their uh, doctorate positions, uh, either clinical or otherwise, and you're helping them understand what is the frame they're working in as far as like if they're working with psychedelics, as far as like what the government allows, how you do that, like all that stuff. How do you get like... I guess, approval for, for certain things. Did I misunderstand that? Is that something? Yeah, you did. So my, um, my professional work with like doctoral level trainees yep. and as well as medical residents and fellows yep. is in a clinic that, that really works in, in training cl future clinicians in working with stress, uh, trauma and the promotion of resilience. So we don't have any kind of overlap with like psychedelic medicine. I see. And then I have other work that I'm doing that does involve, yeah, the Got training it. of psychedelic uh, okay. assisted psychotherapy therapists, so facilitators. I see. What is your, uh, we don't have to go into details, but just your general uh, outlook on what's coming right now with all the legalization. Like, do you feel that this is something that um, is going in the direction of like taking over like a major, major chunk of how we do medicine especially in the in the space of uh, mental health issues yeah I or mean, do you it's, think it's going to be a while before we get to a place like that that's a really good question i mean i i think that clearly what we're doing isn't working i think anyone who looks at the statistics who has adolescents and young adults and just other humans and themselves that they come into contact with know that we're just on a population level not doing great. And this wasn't because of COVID. Um, it was exacerbated by COVID. Um, surely things got worse for our collective, you know, well-being during and post-COVID. But we've had a deferred maintenance on a mental health system for decades, as well as a problematic ideology around mental health. We've separated it, distinguished it from physical health as its own separate entity, um, not really had a dimensional idea of it. We've said that people either have a mental health disorder or don't, as opposed to mental health being something that all of us ultimately live with, that is a dimensional construct that is not just about clinical diagnoses. Like I can be, you know, zero to a hundred on a scale of anxiety. And that can, I can go, you know, 99, I can go 20, I could go 30 within a given hour. And surely if someone's dancing at high levels of anxiety across long periods of time, then we can, you know, ultimately diagnose and we need to in order to be able to connect these people to care 
in the systems in which we've created around care, which require clinical diagnoses in order to then connect people to reimbursable, you know, clinical care models. But none of us are living free of anxious distress. Again, going back to our very evolutionary biology, stress and anxiety help us pass along the genes. Hmm. Like we're no one. So you think it's a natural. So, but, so you're saying, I, I think I understand your point deep, deeper now. You're saying that it's not that the modern world introduced this levels of stress. It just exposed, it plays on the string of the gene that is already in place that is actually part of the evolutionary process, but it just, it just presses against it. It plays that note, so to speak way too often that's beautifully said it plays the note too often because if our if our stress and anxiety you know let's let's take like high levels of anxiety if my high level of anxiety as a tribal human along my 60 to 80 other you know people i live in a tribe with comes when i see a lion and i need to outrun the lion and i have a high amount of stress that releases cortisol that creates the cataclysm of effects that, you know, ultimately kind of, you know, results in like the stress response fully kind of activating within my body, then that is very sensical. That makes sure that my genetic line gets passed along because I don't get eaten by the lion. And, you know, perhaps we're actually the, you know, genetic ancestors or the inheritors rather of a genetic line of folks that were more distressed and anxious because they're the one that survived yeah. they could outrun the lion and the reality is like there's all kinds of ways that the body creates the context for a stress response that mirrors that of the lion and that can come in not getting enough likes that can come in you know not being seen that as is devastating though yeah to, it is it's objectively sure Dev- absolutely devastating Yeah, no, I hear you. And so, you know, not getting enough likes, not having the most occupational success, not being the, you know, coolest person in the room as measured by X, Y, Z, all of these things that we've created that are our social structures that are highly solidified at this point. um, And increasingly, I would argue more and more solidified as we develop for more rigid and more intense social infrastructures and probably unless we disrupt not going to get any better with VR and other mechanisms of creating more social environments that are, you know, technology based because again, the incentives that surround them are inherently flawed in a capitalistic structure, which then create all kinds of cataclysm of problems, not to say, you know, there's necessarily a, a system I'm arguing, you know, that's better than a capitalistic structure, but perhaps there's a more conscious capitalism that can exist when our psychology is more conscious. And that goes back to, I think, the whole conversation around psychedelics and the way psychedelics can be helpful, not just on an individual kind of suffering level, but on a collective consciousness level for how we ultimately structure our later kind of hopefully kind of more right by the collective capitalism. Um, but yeah, I mean, what happens, right? If we're conscious or rather constantly in states of stress and distress and anxiety, and you know, those are being triggered not by the lion, but by, you know, all those imaginaries, uh, well, maybe not imaginary, but all those social cues that don't necessarily didn't exist before. Yeah. The roar, the roaring lion of my phone, not buzzing because no one weird. It just buzzed at that time. (laughs) The, The roaring lion of my phone, not buzzing because I, you know, I, I pick it up expecting that someone would have liked my photos mm. and they didn't. That is so subtle. And yet it, it can be so influential. Yeah. So, and the subtle is often the most problematic, right? Because you don't notice it and it's always there. It's almost like somebody's poking you on the shoulder all day. If you yeah. don't notice it in the beginning and then it just becomes like a, like the Chinese uh, torture with like the drop, right? It's kind a thousand of like, mosquito bites is probably going to be more detrimental than one bite yeah. of like something bigger. Yeah. So because we are very short on time today, yeah. um, we're going to have to wrap it up in a few minutes. I, I do want to ask you one question that is actually, I want to, I want to actually hear from someone who like, again, you, you know, you come from the academic world, academic world. Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, the psychedelic space also has a lot of, uh, anecdotal things, right? So running, like flying around, like all those ideas about what it is. What would you say 
So the, the common thing to say, for example, is that you know it makes us uh, more reflective, or it makes us uh, you know reassess our lives. Those are very general statements. I'm not saying they're not true, but those are like very kind of general statements. It from a more maybe clinical is the wrong word, but f like can we dial in a more specific function that they play in our collective mental health? Like, what would you say? I think we need view? to. No, yeah. what, what, what would you say your view of like what that is? Is it just that, you know, it just shuts off some of the default mode network and it just like, what, what would be that one thing that you can point to and you say, okay, this is generally good for the population? So I think this is, I think, can I answer this in two ways? Of course. I think one way is what I want the research to turn to. And the other way is what my heart ultimately feels. So this has also been the kind of research I've done in digital perinatal, perinatal mental health space where we've looked at an automated internet intervention for women at risk of developing depression during the postpartum period. And after we ran this initial study that was run by my um, dissertation advisor when she was a postdoc up at UCSF, we did a, um, a qualitative analysis essentially of the feedback that we got from a global sample of women who participated in this digital mental health program. And I think often where academia can fail us, especially in research around human psychology, is relying too much on empirical support. So relying too much on, you know, what is the best model for treatment and what is the, you know, kind of what factors account for, you know, the most reduction of suffering, and we do clinical trials to get at that. Um, and there's obviously utility in that, but I think when we're dealing with humans, and we miss a lot if we're just using clinical trial data. I think there's something really powerful in our qualitative analyses, our own verbal reports, and the verbal reports of the people who are actually doing, taking part in the digital mental health intervention, who are like doing the psychedelics. And that we have good mechanisms <clears throat> to accommodate that work into our research. There's so, so I'm interrupting, but uh, something yeah. I'm not aware of. So are those largely ignored when you try to do the analysis for the larger number of people? They're not ignored. It's just harder to do and harder to get funded. And so, and it's also not necessarily what, you know... I don't know. It's not what puts things on the on the desks of decision makers. Mm, because they want to see results over scale. Because that's the thing that pays back your investment, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but the I, reality is, you can have. I mean, we need good qualitative analyses. You can do thematic analyses of, you know, what people feel about, you know, how a digital app affected them, what people ultimately kind of experience in the, you know psychedelic, especially the DMT space. Like we have some cool research coming out, you know, in the last several years about DMT, but it's predominantly white and male and Western. Mm. And we need population level kind of data on the DMT experience with like broad array of sociodemographics from a broad array of countries and different ways of being, viewing the world differently because think about what kind of thematic analyses we can do and what themes we can see will rise to the surface if we actually have large enough data sets that allow us to see what's what's arising. Yeah, well, what is because we expect the archetypes to be somewhat similar in like a certain culture. What if you take somebody, I don't know, from like... Uh, somewhere in the Far East or in yeah. like from the Congo and like they have a completely different... Uh, in, entire social structure. Exactly. Like if we have similar things arising, then we have a very interesting thing here. Exactly. Yeah. Like the we can we can perhaps hone in on some of these like universal truths that these things might be leading us to, if we can really look at yeah like a broad enough data set that really gives us insight into kind of the experiences of a wide array of people who are looking at the world with different eyes than us. Um, so that's like my scientific answer, my plug for what we really, really desperately need in science because the overrepresentation of white folks in clinical research and just in research broadly 
is a big problem in us there's being no, able. Again, sorry, I'm constantly conning you off. But yeah. Like, there's no. There's no. Uh, they didn't because of all the awareness about this stuff now. You, there's no like uh, kind of like they're not correcting for that. Now? It's getting better, but it's slow. Like we published a paper, <clears throat> me and some colleagues, like several years ago, about the ra- the lack of ethno racial representation in mindfulness and meditation based interventions. And I really am a proponent for mindfulness and meditation based work. It is at, at my heart. I believe in it deeply, and yet the research is not great really on its effectiveness because we've largely centered our clinical trials on whiter, wealthier folks. I, even with all the studies that Richie Davidson did with the, that, are you familiar with that? Yeah. Research? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that for sure helps. Okay. But the reality is like, we just don't, I mean, we're, we're getting better, but there's a lot of like problems with the data sets that we have on all of the clinical trials that we've done because we, we, haven't always broadened the net enough to take in an array of different people who are going to have an array of different experiences and we're getting better at it, but we need to be careful because we could be victim of the same problem in psychedelic research as we have been in mindfulness and meditation based interventions. And while we are correcting for it, it's still an issue. And what about your heart? You said the other part. Yeah. So I think my heart, So the question is, right, like what ultimately I think psychedelics are doing for us? If, if I know it's a, it's a broad stroke question, but yeah, if, yeah. if there's one thing that you can kind of like one liner, you can convince an investor to say, hey, mm. this as a professional, I can tell you that this one thing, if you spread that through the population, you will get a net good. I mean, I, this, is, this is a tough question. And this is a question that you might talk to me again in a year and I'm going to have a different answer too. Or in a week, that, who knows? That, 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 that's, a, that's a real answer. Yeah. And for what it's worth, at this moment, what my heart like, kind of calls me to is that I think you know, what's perhaps the most promising piece of what psychedelics can offer us is pulling the wool from our eyes um, that we are separate entities from each other from the pets around us, from the trees around us, from the world around us. And in that moment of being in a psychedelic state where you really have that feeling of ultimate connection to the other, to the collective, to the, that it's all, that it's all one, just that taste of that, I think can change an individual's psychology to no longer see themselves as an individual for perhaps the rest of their lives. And I think that that's a medicine more powerful than anything, because at a time when our biggest, you know, point of, I think, you know, our biggest liability is perhaps isolation, loneliness, disconnection, that's propelling us towards conspiracy theories and cults and all kinds of, you know, false idols. And vilifying the others. Sure. Yeah. Which Absolutely. leads to the biggest atrocities, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. That I think that, you know, peeling the wool away from our eyes with psychedelic medicine taken responsibly. Because, right, psychedelics have also been used for great ills. Psychedelics have also been used to propel cults into kind of stronger kind of solidification or in someone's att- psychology or attempts for mind control by the CIA. Exactly. Well for example, by the way, yeah, yeah for example yeah. that. And so responsible use of psychedelic medicine held in a container where someone gives the other that they're holding the other also being part of them too, of course, if they're holding it appropriately, then that person is able to hold space And, and help that other person, to help that individual really feel the deep connection to the greater whole. And so I think psychedelics for me are only as promising as the wisdom with which we hold them. And my hope is that we, as a culture, can hold them with enough wisdom to be able to give people access to experiences where they're able to see what I think is the true truth 
which is that none of us are separate from any other of us. And I think that if you can hold psychedelic medicine wisely, then we can wake up from the illusion that we've been living in. I got to say, that, uh, that's a perfect answer for that. At least oh, for me, it is. Thanks, yeah. bud. This is, uh, it really encapsulates how I feel about it as well. I think the separateness is the thing that, that causes most of the ills in the world. And I think you're right. Psychedelics used responsibly can actually bring us to the true experience of the fact that we are not separate versus just the idea that you read in a comment section or in a book somewhere. So I uh, can't see a better time, a better note to end the podcast on. And I hope we get to do this again when I uh, either come visit or see you somewhere in the world. Uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time uh, while uh, being so jet like uh, made a lot of sense which is way more than I mm. probably could have done uh, uh, while I was jet lagged. Alex, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank and you, I'll buddy. We'll do this again soon. Thank you, buddy. Anytime. Appreciate you. Thank you.